Yeah. In a communist nation, technically, it is those government elites which do the best. Because they control everything. It's not a matter of individual effort, it's a matter of connections. And you might say, how different is that, right? All right. Ready, folks? Good to go? All right. So, let's talk. Truman. Do you remember Harry Truman? President Harry Truman? Mm -hmm. Vice President under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then Roosevelt dies in 1945. Just like that, he dies. Truman is given the presidency at the height of America's military and economic power when the rest of the world is destroyed and beaten and the only enemy, the only country left over are the Russians, who he doesn't trust and he personally dislikes. And now he's given the atomic bomb and, as I talked about last class, between 1945 when Truman takes the presidency and 1949, a lot of stuff happened which destroyed the relationship between the Americans and the Russians. The Russians imposed communism in Eastern Europe, and Truman was, the Americans were promised the communists would allow democratic elections in Eastern Europe. That didn't happen. Then the communists tried to take over Greece and Turkey, and Truman responded with his Truman Doctrine, giving funds to any nation resisting communist aggression. Then the Americans came up with the Marshall Plan, which funded any nation to rebuild their economy to avoid the spread of communism to them. But then things got worse and worse. 1949, the Russians get the atomic bomb because American spies sold those secrets to the, the Russians. 1949, China falls to communism. A whole other country is gone. 1950, Communist North Korea invades South Korea and the Americans commit troops to stop that aggression. So that's where we're at right now. Late 40s, early 50s. Technically, Truman and his people are looking at the world and saying, there's only two kind of people, the communists and everybody who's against them. And right now, the communists are winning everything. They got the bomb, they got Russia, they got Eastern Europe, they got China. Where are they going to stop? And thus, Truman takes over, and he's got a lot of on, on his plate. Besides the spread of global communism, he's also got millions of men and women coming back from Europe, Africa, the Atlantic, the Pacific, Japan. The, he's, they've got millions of people coming back, and they've got to work. They have to find work, housing. They were promised something for all of their sacrifices. So, while he's dealing with the communists overseas, he's also dealing with all these people that are demobilized and coming home. And during the war, prices were controlled. Regulatory agencies controlled the price of everything so that people could buy food, gasoline, and not be, you know, upset. When the war was over, all those regulations were gone. And now you had all these people that wanted to buy as much as they could with their newfound wealth. Prices shot through the roof. So Truman had to deal with this issue of how do I deal with high prices, all of these people coming back from the war who want homes, jobs, etc., while I'm also dealing with communist aggression overseas and potentially communist spies at home. He had a tough job. And remember, when Truman as vice president got the job as president, he didn't know what the hell was going on. Roosevelt, the president, didn't include him in any kind of dealings. He, Truman didn't even know America had an atomic bomb until he became president. He was like, oh, okay, we have a bomb. We should use this. So what did he want to do? Truman wanted to extend a lot of the momentum of the New Deal and create his own fair deal. Every president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt has tried to either mimic the New Deal with a new name. Truman had a fair deal. This was first? New Deal was first. Oh, fair yeah, deal comes out to Truman. When, I'll be right with you, when Kennedy takes over as president, he's got the Great Society. When, what's his name, LBJ takes over, now it escapes me. What did he call it? No. 
He had the Great Society. JFK had the New Frontier. Everybody had a name. Until things just completely fell apart in the 70s. Uh, go ahead. Well, today, remember that Folsom article you read that was written in the 1980s or 90s? And he's still complaining about the New Deal because of the ideas of big government, economic regulation are still going on today. Um, okay. These are the basic ideas of the Fair Deal all of which were meant to meet the needs of returning soldiers and the post-war American public. What's new? He tried to get national health insurance. Roosevelt tried this in the 30s, and the American Medical Association said, we're not going for it. Truman tried it in the early 1940s and 50s. He also tried to expand public housing and to increase Social Security, because Social Security was not originally meant for domestic workers or agricultural workers. Why? The majority of those workers were people of color. Okay? So he wanted to expand all these. That was his plan. But then he had some problems. All of these soldiers and sailors who came back also, with their immediate frustrations, those problems were happening in conjunction with the strike wave in 1946. Why did America em like erupt in a strike wave in 1946? I'm trying to give you a sense of how much stuff Truman was dealing with. Communists abroad, returning soldiers, a Congress that doesn't like him because it's filled with Republicans that hate the New Deal, and now workers go on a strike wave in the 1946. Why? During the war, there was a deal between labor and businesses. Businesses were allowed to make as much money as they wanted, but they were told, you got to give labor their piece of the pie. You have to recognize their concerns, their weight, etc., etc. And labor was basically told, you can't go on strike every two minutes because we're in the middle of a war. When the war is over, the gloves come off. Everybody across the country goes on strike. Why? Remember I mentioned prices went up? Well, wages didn't go up to match the increasing prices. So now all of a sudden, oil, gas, electricity, food, prices go up, you still get paid the same amount of money, which means you're poorer. Right? It always happens. The cost of living never, our wages never go up as quickly as the, the actual cost of living. You know, there's always like a, a time lag. So. What does this mean? What's a strike wave? Something like 5 million workers went on strike across the country. Well, what kind of workers? All of them. Steel workers, auto workers, coal miners. Hollywood actors went on strike because during the war they simply were paid like a, they paid crappy wages at a time when Hollywood was exploding as a cultural medium. Railroad workers, Everybody was on strike, demanding higher wages. How did Truman deal with this wave of strikes that paralyzed the country? Well, one of them, the coal strikers, the coal miners, he simply ordered them back to work. The government has the right to intervene in certain sectors of the economy and say, you legally can't go on strike because you are crippling the country. So either go back to work or you're under arrest and we'll bring in the army to do the work for you. That was the coal workers. Other people, he established a fact-finding board to figure out what do these people want. And this board recommended higher wages. But then he had to deal with Congress. The same year that he was dealing with a strike wave that paralyzed the country, he lost control of Congress. What happened? Why were the Republicans so strong in 1946 in the House and the Senate? Like, what was Truman doing that was so wrong? Well, first off, remember, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a hero, an icon. So people loved him, even in spite of his policies. But once Roosevelt's dead and Truman starts, wants to continue his policies, Truman is not Roosevelt. He's not that charismatic. People don't know him, and a lot of people don't trust him. Plus, they've had 12 years of New Deal politics. 
now inching into 16 years, and they're fed up. They don't know Truman, they don't really trust them, they're like, we're done. So the Republicans tap into a lot of frustration. First of all, the American middle class. They look around and they see everybody going on strike, and they're thinking, what the hell is going on here? The entire country is going to hell in a handbasket. Who's at fault? Well, the president. Vote Republican. Labor. Traditional allies of the Democratic Party? Well, they weren't too happy with Truman forcing workers to go back to work. The coal workers. So they were disappointed and they stayed home. They didn't vote Republican, they just stayed home and didn't vote Democrat. Now, the Republicans now control both houses of Congress. This is bad. It's exactly what Obama is having today. He is a Democratic president, but the House and the Senate are under an opposing party. In order for something to become a law, it has to be passed by the House, by the Senate, and then signed by the President. Both houses of Congress then, as in Truman's day, are under opposing parties. They don't like the sitting president. They don't want to give him a win. So, they say no to everything. If Truman introduces any bills in Congress, the Republicans just say no. And in fact, they're trying to introduce laws that would kill the New Deal and Truman's Fair Deal. For instance, the Republicans passed tax cuts for the wealthy, which Roosevelt during the war had raised taxes in order to distribute income to other people. But the biggest thing the Republicans did, and Truman was eventually forced to sign, was the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act. This was a significant anti-union law. So after the 1930s, where the government favored unions, by the 1940s, the unions were in trouble. So what did this act allow? It allowed the president to step in and suspend any strike for about three months. If a strike looks like it's going to get too big and too disruptive to the country, the president is authorized to go in and say, you're not allowed to do this. Go back to work or I'll arrest you. Taft Hartley, most importantly, passed, allowed the states to pass laws that made a closed shop illegal. What does that mean? In this country, we have union-friendly states, like New York State, and then we have what's known as right-to-work states, like Arizona, where unions are not really favored. Now, in New York State, if you get a job in a unionized environment, it's generally a closed shop. What does that mean? It means, for instance, the City University of New York, its union, the Professional Staff Congress, it's a closed shop. If you are hired by CUNY, you are automatically represented by the union, and your wages are slightly deducted to pay union dues. It's not a choice. If you get hired by CUNY, you're a, you are now represented by the union. The union's like that because a lot of union dues, money, and political power. Workers don't like it because it helps the unions. Taft Hartley allowed the states who wanted to to outlaw closed shops so that the unions had to go person to person to person, beg them to sign up and beg them to start deducting their paycheck for, uh, for union dues. That was problematic. It hurt union numbers. Organized labor slowly started to suffer as a consequence. Now, during all of this, Truman also decided to dip his toe into civil rights. Not much, but considering he was a white man from the state of Missouri, which is technically the South, and he had relatives and neighbors that were part of the Klan, what little he did, what little he did was revolutionary. Like, this guy was not, you know, living in New York State, New Hampshire. The guy was from Missouri, the South. So what happened under Truman? 
Some state, federal, and local anti-discrimination measures were passed, like in housing, the workplace, you can't segregate according to race. The NAACP moved into the South and increased the number of registered voters, black registered voters, to 20, up 20%. 20 Lynching. Federal marshals finally started arresting people who lynched blacks. Well, who lynched anybody. Remember before, it was basically allowed to happen. People took pictures with their family in attendance. The government finally gets involved and criminalizes lynching and stops it once and for all. Now, the big thing, Truman wanted to do a lot more. He wanted to abolish segregation in housing, employment, education, criminal justice, but the Congress defeated every single initiative he had. So what did Truman do? If Congress is not going to pass laws to end segregation, what can Truman do? He did what Obama did with immigration. He used the power of the presidency to issue an executive order. Obama used his power of the presidency to sign a law that says, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, or what, what do they call it now, Homeland Security, you can't just be deporting children anymore. You can't. We're no longer doing that. Even if they're here illegally, we're not doing that anymore. Truman used his power as the president, as limited as it was, to big effect. Truman desegregated the armed forces because he's the commander-in-chief. He can do this. With just a signature of his pen, he made it illegal to segregate the races and ethnicities in the U.S. Armed Forces. Overnight, it completely changed military culture. Why did he do it? Well, my personal belief is that underneath it all, he was basically a decent guy. He was basically a decent guy, and he, his country had just fought a war against the Germans who were known for exterminating peoples because of their race and he couldn't possibly support segregation after that experience. But there is also some basic strategy. The Americans are locked in a global competition against communism. Right now the world is making a decision. Do we go the American capitalist democratic way or do we go the communist way? And you might be thinking, why would anybody want to choose communism? No voting, no private property, everybody seems miserable in Russia. But the promise of communism, it is said, if done properly, means there is no rich and poor, there is no exploitation, there is just everybody has what they need. And right now, you have to remember, the nations of Africa and Asia are coming out of their colonial empires and they're thinking about what direction to go in. Now it's 1948 and Truman is running for president. Now remember, he ran as vice president in 1944 and won. FDR dies right away and now Truman is running in his, for his own full term. In 1948, Truman had the worst possible situation. It was a four-man race. He was running as the Democrat. Henry Wallace was running as a progressive or more liberal Democrat. Then you had a guy from the South, a Democrat, who was running on Southern states' rights, Strom Thurmond. Deeply racist, belief that the government should not get involved in civil rights. True story, Strom Thurmond, around the time that he died, it was discovered that he had a child with a black woman. So he talked the talk of racism and white supremacy, but he had a child with a black woman. See that? Yeah, exactly. That's what everyone said at the time. And then there was Thomas Dewey, who ran on the Republican Party ticket. Truman wins. 
It's an upset victory. Everybody was thinking he was going to lose because there's a four-man race, which means people have choices. Everybody was so convinced that he was going to lose that the Chicago a Daily uh, what is that, Tribune ran a story that said, Dewey, the Republican, defeats Truman. And Truman, on the night of his victory, held it up saying, look, I beat the odds. This is one of the most famous photos in American political history. Look at the electoral map. The Democrats are traditionally strong in the South, and Strom Thurmond picked up some of the deep South states, but Truman picked up everything else. He picked up most of the South, the entire West, the Midwest, all over here. The Republicans kept their stronghold of the Northeast. Look at this map for a moment. Hey, stop with the thing. Look at this map for up for a moment. Where are the Republicans strong today on this map? Where are they strong today? In the South, right? Where are the Democrats strong today? Northeast, Midwest, West Coast. And then there's a bunch of swing states, right? Uh, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, they're always swinging back and forth. Ohio, Florida, never quite know if they're going to go Democrat, Republican. Back then, the fact that a Democrat took all of this was revolutionary. So now let's get to the stuff that you were reading about earlier. Let's get to the stuff you were reading about earlier. Who is loyal America? This anti-communist hysteria. What was the consequence of the anti-communist hysteria? Well, a military-industrial complex. What's a military-industrial complex? Do you know? What's a military-industrial complex? Yeah. You would think that it's actually one factory, but think of it. Complex is sort of like working together. Military, industrial. What does that mean to you? It is a business. It makes weapons. Okay. In the past, when is the time when factories start working overtime to produce weapons? Generally, what has to happen for a huge investment in weaponry? War. 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 But now, there's a state of permanent paranoia that war is always around the corner, right? The communists, we don't know what they're going to do, so we need to maintain a big army, navy, air force, marines. You follow? That means a lot of government money is put into armaments, right? Not education. Now, it's fine in the 1950s when the U.S. economy can handle everything. It can build highways, it can build tanks, it can build everything. It gets problematic in the 60s and 70s when the money starts running out. But the paranoia keeps the government voting for those sources, right? The other thing was immigration policy. The last time we talked about immigration, we talked about how in the 1920s, immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were not allowed to into the country because it was a fear that they had communist or socialist tendencies, right? After World War II, Congress said, if you're from a communist country and you want to get out, come on in. So refugees from Russia, China, all of Eastern Europe, if they were lucky enough to get out of their country, America was like, come on in. We encourage you to leave your country, come here and say how crappy communism is. Uh, ah. And the big one is assault on the right to dissent. Any criticism is seen as attacking America. So, why did this happen? Why this crazy paranoia? Well, do you remember the very first paragraph of your reading by Commager? It says, Truman has a loyalty program. Right? Do you remember that? Just say you do. Excellent. 
He mentions Truman has a loyalty program. At the time that the communists were taking over Eastern Europe, Truman was concerned that maybe they were getting help from the inside of his own government. And he had to deal with accusations that the Democrats were not doing enough to stop communism. So what did he do? He became the champion anti-communist. And he insisted that every worker in the federal government had to pass a loyalty program. And if they couldn't, if they were a little dodgy, they were transferred, fired, etc. If they were accused by somebody else of being a communist, you would never know who the accuser is. Now you are put in a position of convincing your employer, the U.S. government, that you're not a communist. Yeah. Is that what we're sworn in? I mean, black people sworn in? What's that? That is this. The House Un-American Affairs Committee. This committee was set up before World War II, but after World War II, exploded. And these folks would subpoena people, have them come in, and just ask them, so are you a communist? Who do you know that's a communist? And just keep talking. And you can't lie, because you're under oath. And you can't not show up, because then you'll be arrested. It's like being issued a court summons. So then you're put on trial, and you have to, you know, either rat out your friends, or go to jail for not ratting out your friends. What else caused such a paranoia? Well, there are actual cases of people that were found and convicted of selling secrets to the enemy. For instance, Alger Hiss, this should be a capital H, sorry, I didn't want to screw around the PowerPoint since we've been having so many problems. Alger Hiss was accused of giving secrets to the Soviets in the 1930s. Found guilty, put in jail for five years. The American Communist Party, its leaders, because they're communists, they proclaim that communism should be the American system of government. They didn't do anything, they just said, this is what should happen. They were arrested and put in jail, just for saying democracy should be replaced by communism. Well, the Supreme Court stepped in and said, it's all right. In times of crisis, you don't need freedom of speech. The government can say what freedom of speech is. But one that made everybody crazy was the trial, conviction, and imprisonment of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were convicted of passing atomic secrets to the Russians, thus allowing them to build their bomb. The hysteria caused by all this was out of control. And this man represented the hysteria of the anti-communist movement of the 1950s, Senator Joseph McCarthy. He's a senator from Wisconsin since 1946, but he wanted more exposure. He wanted to be in the limelight. So he looked around and he realized, what do people want? They want someone to stand up against communism. So he stands up and he gives a speech in West Virginia in 1950 or 49, 1950. In 1950, he gives a speech in West Virginia, similar to this, where he holds up a piece of paper. And he says, I know for a fact that there are spies in the U.S. government. I have their names. And I am beginning hearings in the Senate to investigate how deeply communism has infected our system of government. No one ever saw this list of names. No one ever saw this list of communist spies. No one ever saw it. But the country was so paranoid about communism and so afraid of being accused of being a communist if they resisted Joe McCarthy, that they just let him go. So in 1950, 51, 52, 53, 54, he starts issuing subpoenas to everybody in and out of government and he asks them the same question. Are you now, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Yes or no? And if you say no, then the next question is, okay, who do you know who's a member of the Communist Party? And then you can say, well, I don't know anybody. But the thing is, if you got asked to be there, they know you know something. And they'll hold up the proof, and then they've got you online. Which now it's a whole other story, right? 
Before it was suspected communists. Now, lying to Congress, which is a crime. Yeah. And then you might say, I have a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate myself. I'm not asking your question. Doesn't matter you're on television. Now you're guilty by your silence. And then all of a sudden you lose your job. Your landlord doesn't renew your lease. Now, this guy terrorized the American public for four years until he finally went too far in 1954 when he started accusing the U.S. Army of being filled with communists. The problem was in 1954, Truman wasn't the president anymore. Remember, this guy's a Republican, and Truman was at his wit's end with this guy. In 1954, the president was Dwight Eisenhower, a Republican, who was formerly the head of the military in World War II, the head of the Allied Forces World War II. So now you have a former general as president at a time when a member of his own party is accusing his army of being full of communists. So, he got shut down real quick. I'd like to play you a clip of McCarthy's downfall. When people finally get fed up with his being recorded stuff and they call him out on national television and completely destroy his credibility. I think it's about five or six minutes long, so settle in. And hopefully it'll work. We never know anymore around here. I hope it works. I watched it yesterday. It was pretty cool. There it is. Have you no sense of decency, sir? All right. Do we have... Oh, there it is. <laughs> Uh, you know, I that uh, Mr. Wells talks about this being thrown in the office. He was just debating, he has been debating with Mr. Cohen here for hours, requesting that Mr. Cohen before sundown get out of any department of the government, anyone who's serving the communist cause. Now, uh, I just give this man's record, and I want to. A little bit of context. This is Joe McCarthy defending his right-hand man, uh, Robert Cump, the guy that's also done a lot of the interrogating. And so he's saying to the other guy that he is attacking his partner in this anti-communist crusade. All right? And basically saying, you know, stop picking on my guy. He's doing his patriotic duty. Wait till the other guy responds. Mr. Welch, that... It has been labeled long before he became a member. As early as 1844. And I don't know what he's talking about this, but he knows he belongs to the wires. And Mr. Cole now is mad at me. I did do, I think, no personal injury, Mr. Cole. No, I never did do no personal injury. And if I did, I beg your pardon. Let us not assassinate this land further, Senator. Do you have enough? Have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? I don't trick you, Mr. Welch. I'll take it, Mr. Welch. I'd like to finish this. Senator, I think it hurts you too, sir. I'd like to finish this. I know Mr. Cohen would rather have me finish this. Uh, I insisted, however, and Mr. Mr. Welch talks about any sense of decency. It seems that Mr. Welch is paying so deeply, he thinks it's improper for me to give the record, the communist front record, of the man who no more to voice upon this committee. But it doesn't pay him at all. There's no pain in his chest about the attempt to destroy the reputation. And they take the jobs away from the young men who are working in my committee. And Mr. Welch, if, if I have said anything here which is untrue, then tell me. I have heard you and everyone else talk so much about laying the truth upon the table. That when I heard 
and completely phony, Mr. Welch. I've listened to you after a long time to say, now before sundown, you must get these people out of government. So I just want to have it very clear, very clear that you were not so serious about that when you tried to recommend this man to this committee. But the point is, Mr. Chair, I'd like to say again that he does not believe Mr. Welch recommended sufficient as counsel for this committee because he had, through his office, all the recommendations that were made and did not recall any of them coming from Mr. Welch. And that would include Mr. Fisher. Well, let me ask Mr. Welch. You, you brought him down, did you not, to act as your assistant? Mr. McCarthy, I will not discuss this further with you. You have sat within six feet of me and could, ask, could have asked me about Fred Fisher. You have seen fit to bring it out, and if there is a God in heaven, it will do neither you nor your cause any good. I will not discuss it further. I will not ask Mr. Cohen any more witnesses. You, Mr. Chairman, may, if you will, call the next witness. All right. It's at that point that McCarthy really recognizes that simply standing up and saying, you're a communist, come to my committee hearing and tell me everything you know, no one's buying it anymore. That guy, Welch, he was defending one of his co-workers who went to a communist party meeting in 1944 or something or other, and he just finally said, I'm not answering any more of your questions. You can do whatever you want, but I'm not answering any more of your questions. You're destroying people I know for no reason. Have you no sense of decency? And the fact that the groom exploded in applause showed that that fear of being accused of being a communist, if you don't support McCarthy, was broken. Now, before that happened, though, people suffered from a wave of anti-communist uh, activities at the national, state, and local level. The House Un-American Affairs Committee was replicated at the state government level and at the city and local government level. Police departments were hunting down communist organizations. Communists were not allowed to get driver's licenses. They weren't even allowed to get fishing licenses. If you were on a list that said that you're a communist, you couldn't get a license to go fishing. That's how crazy it was in the 1950s. If you were a teacher or a pharmacist, or involved in any profession, you had to take a loyalty oath to the American system of government. Now, you might be saying, I don't understand, what the hell's wrong? Like, why is it so wrong to take an oath to protect, preserve, and defend the American system of government, la 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 la? Because it contradicts basic freedom of speech. You have the right to say, capitalism doesn't work. We should consider another way of looking at it. Democracy is great, but there's also some problems. You have the right to say that. You don't have the right to start killing people in the street, but you do have the right to say unpopular ideas. The Supreme Court, as I mentioned earlier, did not step in. They thought this abuse of First Amendment principles was completely fine. And this anti-communism was a popular mass movement. The strongest supporters of anti-communism, it should not come as any surprise to you, are Eastern Europeans. People that escaped communist East Europe when they came to America, they were the strongest anti-communists. Russians, Poles, Bulgarians, etc. But another one which will surprise you were Catholics. Catholics turned out to be the strongest anti-communists in America. Why? Because communism, one of the things that it believes, besides the fact that capitalism is evil and it makes, it makes people miserable, Communists argue there is no God. Religion is a fairy tale told to make people obey their superiors. There is no organized religion in communist Russia. Catholics took this as a personal affront. Now, besides the paranoia, the other reason why anti-communism was so incredibly successful is because it was effective at advancing people's careers. For instance, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, 
under the directorship of J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director for something like 40 years, in the midst of this paranoia over communism, he drastically expanded the role and the power of the FBI. He had records on everybody. Everybody. He tapped MLK's phone, Malcolm X, women's rights activists. He had stories on how many mistresses John F. Kennedy, the president, had. He had records on everybody. Moreover, if you wanted to advance as a politician, the only way to get to the top of the list is by making yourself the most anti-communist of politicians. So John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who brought us a lot of progressive political advances, these guys, when it came to foreign policy, missile defense, they defended the American foreign policy top to bottom, no criticism. And the other reason why anti-communism was so effective is it allowed you to attack people you didn't like and you never had to mention what you actually didn't like about them. If you're homophobic, you can just say that guy's a communist. If you don't like women's rights, you don't have to say that. You can just say, she's a communist. And on and on and on. Martin Luther King, accused of being a communist. Now, in terms of actual laws, anti-communism was incredibly effective. Let me just go down to the most important one on this page. Operation Wetback. Wetback is obviously a derogatory term used to describe immigrant laborers who work outdoors in the fields. In this case, Mexican Americans. Now you remember Mexican Americans have an interesting history in this country. They're encouraged to come in in the 1920s then they're kicked out in the 1930s because there's no work. Then they're encouraged to come back in in the 19 in during World War II. Now there's another fear that there's too much of a Mexican American presence. How do we deport them? You make this part of the anti-communist crusade. It allows you to restrict immigration to the country. One million were sent, were deported, starting in 1954 with army military help. Further, if you are an enemy of welfare, public housing, public education, any social welfare measures, you can just say you are defending American principles and too much government handouts is too communist. Labor really took it hard. Do you remember, hmm, do you remember that really radical union, the IWW, the International Workers of the World? Do you remember this at all from a few weeks ago? These were the radical, go on strike all the time, very effective. And they were also anti-capitalist. Unions in the 1950s were petrified that if they had too many people in their movement that talked too much about capitalism's evils, the government would come in and destroy the union. So unions all by themselves kicked out all of their most radical members, which weakened them. And civil rights, and this is the last slide, civil rights took a hit. The NAACP and other civil rights organizations were petrified of the reach of the federal government and the FBI. So they kicked out all of their radical communist socialist members. Moreover, they didn't make a big stink about the violation of, of First Amendment principles because of the fear of being accused of being communist. In the 50s, as I mentioned earlier, there was simply a lull in civil rights. There was a bit of a boost in the 1940s in World War II, but in the 50s, it just kind of tanked. But, and this is what the next chapter is going to talk about, the 1950s was a period of tremendous economic expansion, right? Tremendous economic expansion. And this is what I was talking about earlier. The TV shows, Leave it to Beaver, all that stuff. White, suburban families, everybody's happy. But no people of color in those TV shows, right? So the 1950s, in the midst of all of this wealth that is being limited to the white suburbs, but there's increasing poverty in the inner cities, 
is an economic stimulation for the civil rights movement of the later 50s and the 1960s. And that's what we're going to talk about next class. All right? I'm done. Any questions? Come on up. Or just ask them.